Good afternoon and welcome and thank you all for joining us for this second webinar of the of JPAL's Healthcare Delivery Innovation Competition. This webinar will discuss the types of partnerships that this competition looks to build and support. The hosts for today's webinar are Kate Baker, the C. Boyden Gray Professor of Health Economics at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the J.P.A.L. Affiliate, and me, Jason Bauman, Manager of J.P.A.L.'s U.S. Healthcare Delivery Initiative and Manager of this competition. In this webinar, we'll provide a brief introduction to J.P.A.L. We'll talk about the Healthcare Delivery Innovation Competition, what our goals are and the types of programs and policies we're looking to help um, support the evaluation of. Kate will describe her experience collaborating with the Nurse Family Partnership in South Carolina to evaluate the impact of their program on first-time low-income mothers and their children. I'll briefly describe other partnerships that may serve as models for the types of partnerships that this competition is looking to support. I'll do my best to provide helpful guidance on the application process and then we will close and take your questions. Questions may be submitted during the webinar through the chat box as well as through Twitter. So I'm going to start with just a few minute introduction to JPAL for those who don't know us as well. The Abdullah T. Camille Poverty Action Lab, or JPAL, is a research center at MIT dedicated to the alleviation of global poverty. Our mission is to spur research that is relevant to key questions related to global poverty and to, dis and to disseminate the results and spur policy and program change from that research that can help improve people's lives. We do three main activities at JPAL. The first is we develop and implement studies of important social programs relevant to poverty. We do capacity building and training to help others evaluate social programs and understand and interpret the relevant scientific evidence in a particular field of study. And we also engage in policy outreach work to disseminate the results of completed research. We have a team of both professional staff and we have uh, a network of affiliated researchers and universities around the world, of which my co-host Kate is one. On this map, each of the more than 700 dots represents either a completed or ongoing project that one of our affiliates has conducted related to evaluating a social program core to J-PAL's mission of alleviating poverty. Of these projects, more than a fifth are health projects. And at JPAL, one of the accomplishments that we are most proud of is not only the research that we have spurred, but the lives that we've been able to touch through the scale up of programs proven by our evaluations. At JPAL, our expertise is randomized evaluation. This is a type of impact evaluation in which the population eligible for a social program is allocated at random into two groups. One group receives the program and one group does not. The program is run and the outcomes of the two groups are then compared. With the appropriate sample size, the two groups are essentially identical and this generates a clean, clear, accurate, and easy to explain measure of the impact of the program. I'm going to briefly go through another take of why to randomize. So let's say that you have a care coordination program, like one that I'll describe a bit later on in the webinar. And your program is designed to, among other things, reduce hospital readmissions. You have your program, and you notice that the readmission rate begins to go down after the program is implemented. Does this mean that your program works? Well, it depends. Maybe the readmission rate would have gone down anyway, even after the program. Maybe if you pull the sickest patients out of any group, that just by the passage of time, some will get better. 
Or maybe they would have gotten worse without the program. And what a randomized evaluation lets you do is understand the counterfactual of what would have happened had this program not been implemented. So now I'll talk a bit about our healthcare delivery innovation competition. When JCAL began to turn its efforts towards the United States in 2013, the first research initiative that JCAL launched in the United States was the U.S. Healthcare Delivery Initiative. And this initiative stems from our understanding that poverty and healthcare are deeply related in this country. This initiative has worked since its inception to understand what are the key policy relevant questions in this area. and has worked with policymakers and practitioners to build studies related to their priorities. We are grateful to the Laura and John Arnold Foundation and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for their generous support of this initiative. This year, for the first time, we're excited to provide both funding and technical assistance directly to policymakers and practitioners implementing health programs on the ground through our JPAL Healthcare Delivery Innovation Competition. This competition is targeted at folks who are implementing innovative health programs. Eligible applicants include government health agencies, nonprofit health organizations, and innovative for-profit companies. Academic researchers are not eligible to apply, but there may be opportunities to collaborate with eligible applicants. The competition provides a variety of resources to its winners, including technical support, flexible pilot funding, and partnerships with experienced researchers from our network. I want to pause on this point for a moment. I think this is the most valuable resource that this competition is offering the opportunity to work together with experienced academics in our network who have the expertise to design an academic quality randomized evaluation of your program. For applicants that are able to leverage these resources to develop a high quality study, there's also access to funding to support a full evaluation. So what is the partnership with one of the researchers in JPAL's network look like. I'm delighted to introduce my co-host, Kate Baker, to talk about her experience with the Nurse Family Partnership in South Carolina. Thanks so much for having me to talk with people about what has been a fantastic opportunity to work with people in North Carolina to uh, South Carolina, my goodness, to improve the health and well-being of low-income, first-time moms, and really bring the rigor of an academic study to bear to give policymakers the information they need to figure out what's working, how they should devote their state resources, and best reach these potentially vulnerable populations. And we're thrilled to be working with the Nurse Family Partnership in South Carolina, which is a long-standing evidence-based program to bring information, education, services to disadvantaged first-time moms across the nation to improve the mother's outcomes, the children's outcomes, subsequent children's outcomes, and the economic well-being of the family for years to come. And there's a good reason that the Nurse Family Partnership is held up as one of the models of evidence-based policy. And we here at JPAL are dedicated to bringing more evidence to bear so that services can be available in more states and resources are focused on the things that really work because there are a lot of wonderful programs and wonderful ideas, but you really need to devote your money to the places that are improving people's lives and well-being. And South Carolina was really dedicated to that, and there was a major need in South Carolina. South Carolina currently ranks about 45th in child well-being, and there are a lot of effective programs that are on the ground, but figuring out which ones are working would let policymakers devote even more resources to those to try to scale up the programs that are working to improve more lives in a way that's sustainable financially for the state. And that's really important, even though there are an almost infinite number of services we would like to deliver to people, 
as policymakers and researchers and people trying to improve poverty and well-being, we really need to focus on the things that are delivering the results about the clients that we care about. And the kind of evidence that can be brought to bear through partnerships like that implemented with uh, South Carolina and the NFP program and researchers here at JPAL and through all our affiliates, we think can really bring that evidence to bear that you need in making decisions to serve your residents and clients. So the Nurse Family Partnership is held up as a model of such a program because for decades, evidence has been being generated through high quality research endeavors to really uh, assess what the Nurse Family Partnership does for mothers and their children. And I want to talk a little bit about the framework by which this program is supposed to work. We know that outcomes for poor children are worse than outcomes for children that are born with more resources available. That's because of healthcare, it's because of, you know, being read to, it's because of having access to safe homes, being raised in an environment that prevents accidents, being ready for school, avoiding the criminal justice system. All of those outcomes can be improved if we can target low-income vulnerable populations when children are first born to break the intergenerational cycle of poverty. And NFP has been trying to do that for many years and has been very successful thus far. The way the program works is that nurses visit moms, uh, first-time moms, particularly from disadvantaged communities and families, and give them educational information, coaching about healthy pregnancy to try to re uh, reduce preterm birth and low infant birth weight, to reduce accidents and emergency department visits for children in the first few years of life, and to increase birth spacing for subsequent children to ensure that the whole family can be economically self-sufficient and healthy and successful. Now, if those outcomes are achieved, that means better well-being for the moms and their kids, but it also means lower costs for the state's Medicaid program, for social services. There are a lot of potential returns to improving that well-being. But you need to be able to measure those returns to generate the extra resources that are necessary for that early childhood investment. And that's one of the challenges for programs that target early childhood investment. They can have enormous lifetime returns, but those don't accrue right away. The budget implications are spread across different departments of state governments, across the family's life cycle, and not being able to capture those returns in the data makes it very difficult to justify the investment even if it has really high returns. So that's where we step in. Your family partnership in South Carolina has the capacity to expand. They currently serve only about 600 out of almost 12,000 eligible high-risk moms in the state. So there's a huge unmet need for this program. And there's the capacity to build additional resources while remaining true to the model. And that's really important. One of the challenges a lot of programs face in scaling up is that it's very difficult to do something for a thousand moms that works well for 10. But Nurse Family Partnership has a history of being able to scale up, and that's one of the things that we need to assess in South Carolina, is can the model be implemented at larger scale to help more moms while still maintaining fidelity to a model that really works? Now, of course, you also need money to do that, and that's one of the challenges faced by both the state government and by NFP, and that's partly what's innovative about this program. There's a novel expansion underway in South Carolina that I think can be really instructive for other states and for other public policies, not just home visiting programs. The home visiting program of Nurse Family Partnership is being expanded in South Carolina using a Medicaid waiver. These services in the past have been delivered by uh, through philanthropic funds. Whereas now in South Carolina, it's going to be available to Medicaid moms. That's a new avenue of funding that might be opened up. But the extra resources are only going to be available if we can demonstrate that the program works to improve outcomes. And the outcomes we're going to be looking at include reducing preterm birth, increasing birth spacing, reducing childhood injuries, and focusing services on low-income zip codes and moms who need the help the most. If we can demonstrate that it actually works to improve those outcomes, then there'll be a lot more resources to expand nurse-family partnership. If it's not demonstrated to have worked, then the state and funders need to think about where their resources are going to be best devoted. So I don't want to give you the idea that we're going in assuming this is going to work. We're going in to gather the evidence that nurse-family partnership, the state of South Carolina, and states nationwide need to make really good evidence-based decisions to really improve the lives of the populations they're targeting. 
this is a very complicated endeavor. I think you've probably already gotten a flavor of the difficulties of the institutional landscape we're working with. This requires the cooperation and dedication of a really wide range of partners. The Pay for Success Project, that's what PFS stands for here, is possible because of the partnership between the Nurse Family Partnership Central Office, the National Service Office, the nine implementing agencies who actually employ nurses and go out into the households and the communities to help the first-time mothers, the South Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, which is crucial in supporting the study, getting the Medicaid waiver, facilitating all of the data collection that's going to be necessary. JPAL researchers, led by me, a Harvard professor, and a number of really incredible staff people here at, uh, and, uh, here at JPAL, but also uh, social finance, which helps implement social impact bonds and is working with the Nurse Family Partnership, other agencies in South Carolina, philanthropists who are putting up the additional funding, and then uh, an incredible array of state agencies that contribute data to a centralized warehouse in South Carolina that's going to let us trace out a really wide range of outcomes. We all can cooperate on this because of the shared goals of generating this evidence base that's necessary, but also reaching populations who wouldn't otherwise have been reached if there hadn't been a scaled up program delivery possible because of the waiver and because of the philanthropic fund. So that's the setup. Jason talked about something really important in setting up randomized controlled evaluations, and I want to highlight that here. If you're really going to assess what a program is doing, you need a control group. Someone who tells you what would have happened in the absence of the program. And Jason gave a great example looking at hospital readmissions. Think about the case of delivering services to low-income, vulnerable moms. These are women with all sorts of challenges to face in addition to a first-time pregnancy, really scarce resources, a whole range of issues that might make it difficult to have a healthy pregnancy and a healthy newborn. If you didn't have a control group and you just looked at the type of people who were interested in NFP and eligible for NFP and looked at their birth outcomes, this population has substantially worse birth outcomes than the population at large. If you didn't know what a comparable control group looked like, you might think that Nurse Family Partnership wasn't working because, in fact, newborns are more likely to be born early, to have low birth weight, to have childhood hospitalizations but they're probably less likely to do so because of the services than they would otherwise have been, you just need a good measure of what would have happened in the absence of the services. And that's where the control group comes in. By randomizing women who are eligible for NFP services into a treatment group versus a control group, you can get a really good sense of what the program is actually doing. And that's what policymakers need. Now that's nice in concept but it's awfully challenging in implementation. Everyone is involved with Nurse Family Partnership because they want to help moms. And thinking about having some of the moms randomized into a control group that doesn't get NFC services is very reasonably upsetting to a lot of the people involved. We all want every mom to get all services possibly available. What's helpful to remember is that in this South Carolina case, and then I think a lot of the cases that you all will be addressing, there aren't infinite resources available. You're going to have to pick and choose among a wide number of people who might be interested in your program for a scarce number of spots, a limited number of spots. If you're going to have to allocate a limited number of spots, randomization or a lottery is the most fair way to do it. No fewer women are being served because of this study. In fact, more women are being served because of the study because the extra resources that became available through the waiver and through the philanthropic funds are allowing NFP to scale up. So more women are being served because of the study. It's just very difficult to acknowledge the, in the case of a randomized study like this, you have to confront the individual moms who are not being served. There were always people who weren't being served in South Carolina, but they weren't as visible when they weren't coming in to get randomized into the treatment or the control group. And that's a really uncomfortable reality that I think everybody has to learn to deal with, and I think is for the good of women in South Carolina and the, the whole nation in thinking about whether these programs work, but is a really challenging aspect of any randomized controlled design that I want to highlight for you all. For the study to work, you have to get all of the women in who might want to participate in the program and might be eligible for it 
get their informed consent to participate in the study, and that is absolutely crucial, administer a baseline survey, and then do the randomization. And the women who are in the control group get all of the business as usual services. They just unfortunately don't get one of those limited spots in NFP. That's only a third of the women. Two-thirds of the women in our study are randomized into NFP and get those extra services and are then part of the regular NFP delivery system. We'll be measuring all sorts of outcomes. I highlighted some of the key outcomes that are crucial to the pay-for-success component, where reducing preterm birth, increasing birth spacing, and reducing childhood injuries are going to be the basis on which those extra resources are or aren't available. But as academic researchers and as people who are interested in improving the health and well-being of low-income families, we want to know about lifetime health. We want to know about participation in other social services, the children's educational attainment, what happens to interactions with the criminal justice system, substance abuse, use of other social services. There are an enormous array of things that might be improved by the delivery of these crucial early childhood and pregnancy services, and we're thrilled to be able to assess all of them. And we're the kind of people who get really excited about data. I hope you can hear it in my voice. And South Carolina is an amazing place to do this because of the linkages of all sorts of administrative data. We are not going to be bothering the nurse family partnership nurses who are delivering services or the study participants after they've enrolled in the study. Instead, we're going to be gathering all the information for these assessments from administrative databases that are already collected for the administration of health benefits or social services. Those data are all sitting in South Carolina. Once we gain access to those data, we can follow the treatment group moms and the control group moms in those administrative databases to figure out whether these services are improving the lives of these children, subsequent children, the whole family, without imposing any extra burden on the mothers or children or on the nurse family partnership staff. Once the, once the moms are enrolled in the study, we're out of everyone's hair. And, and I think that's really important because these are hard jobs that service delivery organizations are doing. We're here to facilitate the gathering of the kind of evidence they need to be able to scale up appropriately. We need to do that in a way that is least burdensome for the state agencies, for the partners, for the participants. And that's part of what we're dedicated to in these partnerships, is ensuring that studies can layer on top of existing programs with minimal hassle, minimal extra burden, while maintaining scientific rigor. Because all of this is for naught if we can't generate the kind of evidence that policymakers can really rely on when making tough decisions about program delivery. So I hope that's a little bit of helpful background about this particular study, and I'm really eager to hear about the studies that you're all dreaming of. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, that was a wonderfully helpful description of um, your work in South Carolina with NFP, and um, uh, I'm sort of always eager to hear updates at uh, staff meetings and otherwise in the office about how that study is, is progressing. Um, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about a few other uh, partnerships that we've supported today to the extent that they might be useful models for the types of support of partnerships we'll support through the competition. So the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services have uh, this program that mails informative letters to doctors that are suspected of over-prescribing high-risk control substances. So these are Schedule II drugs that include opioid pain relievers and other similar substances. And the program essentially identifies suspected over prescribers, sends them a letter that says, gee, you're prescribing a lot of these, um, and is designed to reduce the uh, prescribing of these particular physicians. CMS is really interested in understanding whether this program works um, and collaborated with researchers in our network and the White House's social and behavioral sciences team to design a randomized experiment in which some physicians received these letters and others didn't, and then used the data that they were already collecting on prescriptions to assess the prescribing behaviors of those who did and did not receive the letters and um, to see if there was any impact. The study, because it leveraged already data that was already being collected and because it was uh, looking at shorter term outcomes, was able to be completed in about a year and was actually a quite low cost study. 
And it found in this case that the program didn't seem to have any effect at all, um, which has proved to be an interesting illustration of how a study showing null effects can actually be extremely helpful to the implementing partner. CMS now knew that there was sort of little evidence that this program worked, and then subsequently collaborated with researchers to redesign the letters to improve their address database so that more of the letters would reach doctors, and to send multiple letters to see if that could improve the impact of the program. Helping uninsured individuals enroll in health insurance and helping individuals and families make better choices amidst the maze of health insurance options that sometimes faces them has been a topic of great interest. Two state health insurance exchanges, one in California and one in Colorado, collaborated with our researchers to design and implement an intervention aimed at providing information to consumers to help encourage them to sign up for health insurance and help make better plan choices for themselves and their families. They worked together to send variants of this information to randomly selected groups of consumers on these exchanges. And when they analyze the data from this study, they'll have a sense of if these informational campaigns were useful, which ones were most helpful, and this will be able to inform future campaigns both within these exchanges and in other states. The next program I, I'll talk about is a much more intense, higher touch intervention. So this is a program run by Dr. Jeffrey Brenner and the Camden Coalition of Healthcare Providers. It's an innovative care coordination program that supports high need patients. So these are the 5% of patients that account for more than 50% of healthcare costs in this country. And this program provides care coordination services, medical management, and access to social programs to help improve the health outcomes and reduce the health expenditures associated with these patients. Dr. Brenner and the Camden Coalition wanted to know, does this program work? And this is actually quite a difficult question to answer with this population because there's fairly good evidence to suggest that if you take a snapshot of the sickest group of patients, the patients that are likely to be enrolled in a program like this, over time, some of them will cycle out and, and become healthier because they sort of had hit bottom right before getting into the program. Unfortunately, in Camden, New Jersey, there are more patients that are eligible for this type of program than the program has resources to support. The Camden Coalition leveraged this oversubscription and collaborated with researchers in our network to design a randomized evaluation of this program to answer the question of what would have happened to these patients had this program not existed. And they're excited to be able to use this evidence to inform whether this program should be scaled up both in Camden and many other places around the country. Finally, uh, this is an example of a, uh, a study with a private company where my co-host Kate Baker is actually one of the principal investigators. So BJ's Wholesale Club wanted to improve the health of uh, their employees. Um, and they had the audacity to ask the question, do these workplace wellness programs that many large employers offer that sort of provide diet, uh, consulting, and encouragement to exercise and uh, stress management programming, do these programs actually work? Um, and Kate and her, uh, her co-investigator have worked together with BJ's to design a randomized trial, which will allow them to answer this question and inform is this the type of program that they want to invest in the future? And other companies will also be able to use this evidence to understand whether this is something they should invest in the future and sort of what types of these programs are most useful. So from this group of partners, I want to pull out a few characteristics that are common among them and characteristics that we're looking for in potential applicants to this competition. All of these partners were quite willing to experiment and really interested in knowing the impact of their program. On this point, I want to flag two opportunities for doing this. One is the um, oversubscribed program that Kate mentioned in NFP and that I mentioned in Camden. 
The other is this concept of smart piloting, where if you're rolling out a program to a subset of people initially, if you roll it out in a random way, you can get a really clean estimate of the program's impact that can inform future scale-up efforts. All of these programs have had adequate reach in terms of people served. The Camden Project, which is a very, um, the program's a very high intensive, a high intensity intervention, that study serves, is involving 800 people, 400 in treatment and 400 in control. Programs that are less intense interventions require higher sample sizes. All of these partners and programs have had outcomes that are trackable in administrative data, not just in surveys. And finally, all of them have had a high level commitment within the organization to rigorously understanding the impact of their programs. So I'm now going to provide a little bit of what I hope will be helpful guidance on the application process. We launched this competition with the understanding that folks who are implementing innovative health programs are really busy implementing innovative health programs. And with that in mind, we've tried to make the application process as light of a lift as possible. The only required document for applying is a three to five page letter of interest. This is due on June 17th and essentially describes the healthcare challenge, the program that the applicant is proposing to address the challenge, and certain details about the program. The instructions to the letter of interest are available at the link that's currently on the slide. And like the application, the instructions themselves are short. I promise you, I wrote them. Um, and we can, we can help with applications. So please feel free to uh, email or call um, with any questions that you might have. So what are we looking for? So there's a lot on this slide, but I thought it would be useful to lay out in one place some of the most important considerations that we'll be thinking about when we select applicants. We, we care about there being an important healthcare issue, something with large-scale policy implications and a program where either the implementing partner or others elsewhere would be able to scale it up if it's proved effective. We're looking for something that has the potential to implement a lot of people. We're the Poverty Action Lab, and we really care about programs that impact disadvantaged populations. We'd like there to be some evidence that the program might be helpful. Certainly, we're not expecting the rigor of a randomized evaluation, but some sense that this is likely to work. It's important that there be a feasible opportunity for our affiliates to use their expertise in helping the applicant launch a rigorous study of their program. With this in mind, we're looking for programs that have an adequate potential sample size, that have outcome data that can be tracked through ways other than surveys. And it's important that applicants are willing to randomize access to their programs. We're also looking for applicants to have adequate operational capacity to implement the programs at the scales required for randomized evaluation at high fidelity and that these programs are sufficiently developed in their implementation that from a process standpoint, we can be confident that they work. We're also looking for high level support within the organization. If the application is not being submitted by a high level leader in your organization, we encourage you to submit a letter of support from your organization's leadership. Leadership buy-in is something that's really important in paving the groundwork for, an for a successful study. We also welcome folks to reach out to us before they apply for feedback on application ideas. We're inviting people to reach out and email and set up a short call to discuss a potential application with us before they submit it. We'd like to help applicants create applications that are as strong as possible and then we think in a phone call, we may be able to anticipate potential questions and issues that might come up in the review process. So if you'd like to submit an application, we invite you to reach out for preliminary feedback. We'll do our best to get back to you and provide timely and useful feedback. And in order to maximize the, the likelihood of us being able to do that, we recommend that you reach out by Wednesday the 1st of June.
So I'll close now and remind you that applications to this competition are due on June 17th. We'll announce winners about a month later. You can sign up for updates on our website, and please feel free to reach out to me with any questions you might have. So now we'll pause for a moment and give you all the opportunity to ask any questions that you might have of us. Great. So we'll start with a question about pilot funding. So this question is, what can pilot funding be used for? So I'll take this one. Um, pilot funding may actually be used for a variety of things. It's designed to be quite flexible. Um, it can be used to cover staff time to coordinate uh, activities during the um, evaluation startup year. It can be used to hire a short-term research assistant to connect um, different data sets. It can be used to think about the requisite sample size for a study or to establish a baseline for a study outcome. Um, it can be used in connection with a process evaluation of a program or it can fund the development and field testing of a survey instrument. Um, some cases it might be enough to pay for a low-cost service like an informational intervention. Um, but in most cases, we'll anticipate that the applicants will use sort of traditional sources of funding to fund implementation and that um, the pilot funding will be available to, to get the evaluation into place. And I think one other point I just want to emphasize on that is that it's not our expectation that $50,000 will be enough to cover the full evaluation cost, but rather we're offering folks that are able to partner with a researcher in our network and design a quality evaluation that there'll be access to a pool of funds that will provide support for a full evaluation down the road. So you mentioned using pilot funds to generate a sample or a proof of concept. And there's been another question, what is adequate sample size and is there a minimum? And that's a great question and it's one that the JPAL researchers can be really helpful, I think, to policy implementers in designing. The real answer is, it depends on how big an effect you're looking for, which I realize is not a very helpful answer. But when you're doing an intervention that's likely to change the outcome you're measuring by a lot, you can get by with a smaller sample size. When you're doing an intervention that may be effective for a lot of people, but on a somewhat smaller scale, you're going to need a bigger sample size to be able to determine that. And that would be a kind of question that would be really helpful to pose to the JPAL staff as you're developing your application so that we can give you feedback in your specific instance about how many people you're likely to need to enroll. And the answer is going to be different if you're doing a pilot where you're just trying to kick the tires, make sure it works, design something that is scalable. You can have a pretty small pilot to assess that. If you are then looking for the overall effectiveness of the intervention, it's going to need to be bigger. That might be hundreds of people, that might be thousands of people, but that's something that we would be happy to work with you in your specific instance to do the calculation. Thanks so much, Kate. All right, so to take another question, um, is it helpful to have uh, researchers already associated with the application. Um, it's not necessary. We're, um, we have a network of um, expert academic researchers that um, we're hoping that this competition can help uh, you all leverage and, and take advantage of. What we really are looking for is an innovative program um, and the sort of potential for it to be studied. And, we can help with the evaluation. And I see a follow-up question to that, which is can university-affiliated researchers be part of the application? And this application is not intended for our affiliates or for academics, but if you have an academic you're interested in partnering with and you've already made contact, that's great. And you should bring that person to the table and that person can help you with your application. But you, the policymakers, are the um, intended audience and target population for this particular round of funding.
is it possible to do a previous study but in a new state or region? I think if you have an intervention that's been tested in one context and that you are hopeful might work in your state or your region that you don't have evidence on, that's a great idea. And being able to scale up things that have worked in small settings to regional or statewide settings, that's a high priority of JPAL. So just your idea does not have to be something no one has ever seen or thought of before. It can be building on things that have worked in other settings, but trying to extend them to new ones, or trying to develop them for new populations, or to deploy them at larger scope. It's great to build on existing ideas or programs. It's also great to come up with something new. I think we're really possible on that front. Absolutely right. I see another question. All right. Um, so this question is, is about who is eligible to submit. Can nonprofits submit or only government organizations? Uh, nonprofits are, are welcome to submit. Uh, and it can be a nonprofit sort of as a um, community organization or it could be a nonprofit uh, hospital um, or network of, of physicians. Um, but nonprofits, uh, as long as they're sort of running the programs that are um, that are the subject of the application are, are eligible to submit. So here's another question. Um, can a single jurisdiction submit applications from more than one agency or department or organization? Um, and the answer to that question is yes. So different, there can be multiple submissions from different parts of a state government. Uh, when feasible, of course, it's great for uh, the various agencies to collaborate on a single application, but um, we certainly welcome, uh, would welcome applications from different parts of the same, um, the same entity. And I'll take another question is that does my, does my application need to talk about only one program? And the answer to that question is no. If you have several programs, any one of which you think might be uh, might be a good fit for this competition, you're welcome to list all of them in your application. Um, or even better, reach out to us beforehand and we can talk through with you which ones might be the best fit. Uh, another question on how many awards will be given through this competition. So we're looking to select two to four winners. Um, who will qualify for the uh, the pilot funding, the technical assistance, and the uh, connections with our network of researchers. And we hope to work with all of those winners to get them to a place where they can apply for the larger amount of full evaluation funding. See, there's another question here. So the question is, if the plan is to do a randomized controlled trial, but the development process determines a different approach is more appropriate, will grant funds still cover that development process? So the uh, the grants that the, the the pilot grant funds will be available for that process as long as the initial intent is to do a randomized evaluation, and certainly sometimes the and this is the sort of beauty of piloting, you'll learn that a study is feasible and sometimes you'll learn that it's better studied sort of in another way. And so once those, once a winner is selected and those, those funds are sort of allocated to that winner, they will have access to the full $50,000. Um, so there's no need to worry about needing to return funds if it turns out that a study isn't infeasible. And that brings up a great point about these studies in general. Not every pilot ends up developing into a full-scale evaluation. If we knew that was going to happen, we wouldn't need to do pilots. So the pilot helps us figure out what might be a good target for this and what should we leave by the side. And then by the same token, not every evaluation finds out that programs work. In fact, it better not, <laughs> or we're not doing the right uh, are the right 
job as evaluators. Sometimes at scale, the intervention is going to be shown to be a wild success, and sometimes it's going to be shown to have a smaller effect than anticipated, no effect at all, a negative effect, and that's why what we're such big fans of evidence, because you are sometimes surprised by what you find, and that's true of the pilot as well. That's absolutely right, Kate, and to give just another point on that, um, we view evaluations also as sort of a learning opportunity that's out of program, and, and to the extent that an evaluation finds an, a null or a sort of smaller effect than expected, it could be a really great opportunity for the implementing organization to, um, to improve their program. Our affiliates conduct evaluations with um, sort of process questions in mind, and they're often conducted not just to sort of give an up or down to, to whether a program works, but to understand why it works, how it works, and what parts are, are most effective. So it can be a great, um, a great opportunity to better understand the impact of your program and think about how to make it better. So I think we, I'll take one more question. Um, and so this question is, um, what's, what's about the research timeline? Uh, maybe two more questions. It looks like there's, uh, there's a bit more than that. Um, so what is the timeline for research? So this is, this is flexible based on the, the application, but, um, and they'll be discussed with each sort of applicant when they're selected, but we're hoping that evaluations can begin within a year of awards being given in, in July. Uh, and then, then a question on whether the PowerPoint will be uh, available afterwards. The answer is yes. We will post both the slides and a recording of this webinar on our website, uh, most likely the beginning of next week. All right. Well, I think that's, I think that's all. Um, if any other questions come up afterwards, please feel free to reach out and email us. We thank you very much for your time and attention. And uh, we, uh, we encourage you to apply if this competition is the right fit for you.